our next guest, Chris Bishop, um, might not be familiar to all of you because he's from Wellington. Um, and because he's a National Party MP and you're a bunch of Liberals, but, you know. But um, Chris is kind of the... He's kind of the national MP that, that gets on with the Liberals on Twitter. He's the, he's the, he's the social Liberal. Um, uh, and also, and I think this is kind of significant about Chris, is that while he was a, um, uh, a List MP in 2014, in 2017 he took the traditionally Labour seat of Hutt South, and he did it by being a very good local candidate. Um, welcome, Chris. Good to be here. Um, let's talk about that first. I mean, because I get the impression that although we, we work under an MMP system, there have been a couple of things that have happened in, the, in recent years, and I'm also thinking of, of Michael Wood and, and Roskill, even though that was a Labour seat. Mm. He made a virtue of winning it as a local candidate, didn't he? Yeah, and Michael, um, I've got to know Michael a bit because he, um, he came in the last parliament. He's a really effective local MP and uh, you know, really places a priority on that grassroots efficacy. I mean, he'd been involved in Roskill local politics for years and years. But, you know, look, as you know, an MMP, it's the party vote that counts. You know, our former party president used to drill that into us, that it's the party votes that determines the government. But there is a... I think there is a, um, a recognition that local efficacy is important as well. Um, and, you know, if you look at someone like Nikki Kay, um, you know, one Auckland Central, you know, I mean, the tide was coming in back in 2008, National was doing really well, but um, that seat had never been held by National before ever, um, a bit like Heart South actually, and, uh, you know, she won that seat and, you know, John Key really prized that, you know, he really recognised that she could, you know, speak to people who perhaps hadn't been traditional National Party voters, and because to win a seat that's never been held by National before, you need to speak to people who haven't voted for National before, um, so that's really important. So what's the trick to it? Is it being available? Yep, turning up to the opening of an envelope, that helps. <laughs> um, look, it's, it's, I don't think there's anything, uh, it's not rocket science, it's, it's just hard work at the grassroots. So, you know, in the hut, you know, I did go to a lot of events, but I also ran a lot of events as well. So I was doing public meetings, you know, every sort of three or four months on topical local issues, pushing things that I cared about. So the idea of um, developing the technology sector in the hut, um, Lower Hut's got a, a, a huge, um, you know, business community centred around science and innovation. Got a lot of CRIs in the hut, so pushing the development of that, things like that. Um, and just, um, I did a lot with young people as well. Um, did, a lot, did a lot of work in schools, did a lot of work with young enterprise, um, a lot of work with uh, developing youth leadership potential, things like that. So, you know, look, I think, you know, it's, it's just, it's not nothing rock science, it's just a lot of hard work at the grassroots. And yet you won your seat, but you're not in government. You're in opposition, and I... And I I do get the feeling from from and, and some national MPs, including you, that you feel a little bit robbed. Is is, is there that mood in the party? <laughs> but like on the night uh, Winston announced his um, verdict, Bill uh, came up to me and said, "How does it feel, mate? You know, you won Hutt South for national for the first time ever against the run of play, and we lost. <laughs> and yeah, you know, it was pretty tough, obviously. Um, look, it's it's an, a result that's never happened in New Zealand before." And, you know, constitutionally, and I've made, I've made this point before online and I think to a few people in, in private, uh, constitutionally, of course, it's, it's totally acceptable. And, you know, Dean Knight and various other people and people who've, uh, who study this stuff uh, pointed it out. But politically, I think for a lot of New Zealanders, it's been quite hard to handle because, it, you know, you know ro wrongly, people think that the highest polling party forms the government. And it's confused a bit by conventions in other countries, although not in New Zealand, but conventions in other countries where if you get the highest number of votes or m most number of seats, you know, the sort of convention is the Governor-General or the Queen has the, you know, sort of works with you to form a government. Now, that's not the situation in New Zealand, but a lot of people, perhaps misinformed people, have made that point. So it's been quite hard for a lot of National Party supporters to handle. Um, but look, the, the result is the result, you know? I mean, and as I pointed out online before, in plenty of countries, governments change at the barrel of a gun. In New Zealand, the sky, you know, rose the next day, the sun rose the next day, and Jacinda Ardern's our Prime Minister, and we just get on with it. You wrote this, uh, a post... <laughs> <laughs> you wrote a post for the spin-off, um, and, and you wrote that, that your government left New Zealand prouder, wealthier, more confident and aspirational um, than it had been before you took office. Which sounds like, how could, how could such an awesome government um, be voted out? Do you, do you understand why maybe not everyone thought that? Maybe not everyone felt the love there? Yeah, so um, I, I, th I do think we were a good government. Um, 
But I also don't think we were a perfect government. And in the preface to that spin-off piece, I said no government's perfect uh, and uh, no government ever delivers on the, the, the dreams of its most fervent supporters and that will be true for the Labour New Zealand First Greens government too. Uh, and already you can see a bit of disappointment amongst some sectors of the community about that. Okay, okay well, you know, that, that, that will be true. Um, and it's true that the national government didn't achieve everything we set out to achieve. But I think um, when you look at across the broad range of metrics, we're, we're a good government. Um, we didn't get everything right. I think um, housing was a big miss, obviously. Uh, for people of my uh, generation, uh, my age, I'm um, 34, um, uh, the, uh, the prospect of owning a house is something that's, that's a difficult one to grasp. And uh, I, I think that was a, a fail for us. Um, I think on, on th things like material deprivation and, um, and hardship, particularly for kids, um, that was something we needed to do more of uh, faster and sooner. Um, I think we had, we had enormous potential with the social investment model uh, that we're rolling out. Um, and, but, but yeah, look, no government's perfect. Um, you, at one point, uh, on, uh, no, uh, come on, you can, you can write your question down. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, one day on Twitter recently you heralded the new employment figures, which are indeed quite strong. The other thing that strikes me about those figures is if you take out the rest home workers settlement, real wages actually fell. And I wonder what's going on in New Zealand when labour demand is high mm. and the price of labour falls. Do, should we be, you know, outside party politics, what do we do about that? <laughs> it's probably a bit big for this conversation. I mean, that's one quarter. Um, if you look across the last 10 years, real household income's up 40%. Um, After-tax wages are up um, 25%, at twice, twice the rate of inflation. Um, now we want to drive that up further, but you know, the answer to that is a, is a long-term structural problem that's been in the New Zealand economy for probably 40, 50 years, which is R&D and productivity. And uh, you know, lots of people have got different views about how we raise um, productivity, and lots of people have got reasons as to why our productivity is not what it should be. One of them is the distance from market conundrum, where the furthest away from the rest of the world, although broadband and technology is changing that. Um, the other is the low skills um, base in New Zealand, which we need to do more of. So, look, that's a, that's going to be a problem that the the current government's going to grapple with, and one that we're going to work hard on opposition as well. Um, Actually, what, what kind of opposition are you going to be? Because I think people may be a little bit concerned about that quote from Bill English, you know, it's not our job to make the place run. <laughs> that sounds nihilistic. You know, are, you, are you going to be a loyal and, and vigorous but constructive opposition? Yeah, look, I, th I think so. I mean, we were pretty constructive just the other day with this proposal around uh, more flexibility around paid parental leave. I mean, that was a, a genuine... Um, a good idea, which I think most people acknowledge should happen, and for various reasons, Labor decided it, it, it shouldn't happen, at least not straight away. Um, so, you know, we, we have 56 seats in the House. Um, we are going to put up robust opposition to stuff we don't agree with. And look, I, I know I just said after the election, in relation to the HUP, but it applies generally as well, when I agree with stuff that Labor does, I'll say so, or the National will say so, and when they don't agree with things, I'll say so as well. And the New Zealand public don't deserve anything less than that, and the 44 or whatever it was, percent of people who voted for National, um, want us to do that as well. So um, I, I think we'll be constructive where we can be, uh, but you know, oppositional and, and, and confrontational when we have to be. But I think it's going to be a tricky balancing act because one of the things that I think has defined uh, Bill and John Key's leadership of National is quite a positive and upbeat um, message and vision. And opposition, and Andrew Little found this when he was opposition leader, and so did David Shearer and the leaders before that. Opposition means you have to be negative in some ways. You know, you have to oppose. And actually, people don't like that. And already I've had people emailing me saying, oh, you guys are so negative, you're so you know, negative, so oppositional and stuff like that. But actually the role, the constitutional role of Her Majesty's loyal opposition is to, you know, is to critique. But actually most New Zealanders are pretty, uh, they like the positive in politics. So walking that fine line between being positive about the vision National's got for, for, for the country, but also critiquing is going to be tricky. And successive opposition leaders have struggled with that. But because, yeah, I imagine that it's going to be quite hard. I mean, I don't think any National MP has voiced anything about the Lord Jacinda moment on Thursday night at the New Zealand Music Awards, because if you say anything about that, you are going to look like a dick. Well, I was just angling for an <laughs> invite to the Music Awards. You should come along. Invite me. I'd love to have gone. Well, no, I went to the Lord concert on uh, last week. Well, this is actually one of the things I like about you is you paid for your own ticket and went to Lord. You're, I did. you're actually a music fan. At the Bruce Mason Centre. 
wanted yeah. to be at the power station. But yeah, with Bruce Mason. And I, I, can't, I actually kind of look at you and also look at, at Jacinda Ardern, who is someone who's been to Splore because she wanted to go. She yeah. feels a little bit like my tribe in that respect. So there's a, there's a kind of a... Is there a cultural demographic there? Yeah, well, uh, Jacinda's an old friend of mine. I mean, we, um, yeah, I've known her for 15 years. Um, we did, were involved in schools debating for a while. She was a schools debating coach when I was coming up through schools debating and, and then we were administrators together and stuff. So I've known her for ages and, you know, like, were you, always, with... were you always like you were the young Nat and she was the young Labour? Oh, she's a touch, a touch older than me, so the, the mm. generations didn't quite cross over at university. She's three, three years older than me, I think, or maybe, maybe four. But look, you know, anyway, I served on the Justice Committee with her in the last Parliament. Well, I don't agree with her on much stuff. Well, I agree with her on actually probably more than probably people in the room think. Um, but, you know, and I wish her the best as Prime Minister. Um, so, you know, and look, there is one part of me which is like, I'm 34. It's cool that a 37 or 38 year old person of my age that I know is Prime Minister. That is, that is genuinely pretty cool. Um, you know, I just wish you'd change your stance on a few things, but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's um, right. that's politics. Chris, Chris Bishop, thanks, thanks very much, and come back and, um, and join us on the panel, because I'm sure thanks. there'll be a few other questions. Cheers. Yeah.